cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, let's dive deep into brain health today and a series of nootropic compounds called racetams, which are thought to induce cognitive benefits and neuroprotectivity and anecdotally are used by probably hundreds of thousands of people. Very popular compounds in paracetam, which was developed in the 1960s, is considered the first nootropic. And although these compounds are generally well studied and well tolerated, there's no definitive agreed upon conclusion about how they work. Their mechanism of action is a point of debate, and it's unverified. However, what we know is much greater with some racetams more so than others. This doesn't mean we can't comprehensively sift some good knowledge through the research that's already been conducted. Typically, compounds within the same class are named for a structural core feature, which is no different for racetams, which share what's called a pyrrolidone nucleus. There are some racetams in clinical practice today. One is popularly levetiracetam, which is an anti-epileptic medication used in management of a multitude of seizure conditions. It's generally well tolerated, however, it can stimulate adverse mood changes like fatigue, irritability, anxiety, just to name a few. But let's shift our focus to paracetam, phenylparacetam, and nupept. Paracetam, the first of its kind, is thought to intermingle within cognitive function, learning, and memory, and as such, it's popularly known as a nootropic, and as we said earlier, the first nootropic. From a structural standpoint, it's quite similar to the neurotransmitter GABA, but made into a cyclic formation. GABA, or gamma-aminobutyric acid, is our inhibitory neurotransmitter, one that modulates the anxiolytic and sedative effects of benzodiazepines and alcohol alike. But interestingly, although derived from GABA, the effects aren't directly through this neurotransmitter. It's not something that binds GABA receptors and induces the same function. Rather, it's thought to operate via interaction with different neurotransmitters, notably glutamate and acetylcholine. It's also thought to enhance cell membrane fluidity, a restorative effect that improves cellular functions, particularly in different regions of the brain, which would be of most interest in a population of older people. And this is the theory that really guides a lot of what we understand or what we research on paracetam today. And a study in aged mice echoed these findings, where there was restored brain fluidity in older rodents given paracetam, however, the younger ones with normal baseline fluidity didn't see an effect. And in a way, these findings are thought to translate to other cell types, as a culture study of elderly human platelets showed improved platelet membrane fluidity in those administered the compound. And thus, it's also been seen to interact with vasculature as well, affecting different components of blood circulation. And so at its core, paracetam is thought to influence neuronal and vascular health, through this hypothesis known as the membrane fluidity hypothesis. And that's where it sits at this point. It's a hypothesis, something that's, of course, tough to verify, but something that hasn't been 100% solidified within the literature. Even the neurological impacts of paracetam are proposed in some way or another to be through improved membrane fluidity. And it does seem to influence these different neurotransmitter systems, glutamatergic pathways involving glutamate, cholinergic involving acetylcholine, and noradrenergic, which are the sympathetic responses involving epinephrine and norepinephrine. And oftentimes with features of cognitive decline, the dysfunction of these neurotransmitter systems. It's why medications and Alzheimer's disease seek to decrease breakdown of acetylcholine because doing so can hopefully have some cognition preservative effects. And animal studies have highlighted results that indicate some sort of interplay in aged rodents where receiving paracetam likely influences transmission via these different neurotransmitter systems, essentially an increasing presence of receptors as well as the function of those receptors themselves. Preclinical models have also shown an anticonvulsant effect and neuroplastic effects in rodents whose brain circuitry was disrupted with alcohol. Vascular effects are proposed to be decreased endothelial adhesion, preventing blood from sticking to the walls of the vessels, decreases in coagulation, and in animals where brain or kidney prevented from receiving adequate blood supply, improved perfusion to these areas appears to be induced by the compound through these vascular effects. 
There are a range of clinical trials in humans, mostly collected from the 70s to the early 2000s. The collection of human data is notably and popularly heterogeneous, meaning that although there's a good amount of total data collected, the patient populations, dosages, and targeted primary endpoints are diverse, and so drawing finite, definitive conclusions are tough. And if we're looking at the collage of all the research done as a whole, you do see that there's a lack of verified findings. And more often than not, it doesn't support the use of paracetam. One of the biggest trials looking at it was the PASS study, a large multi-center, double-blind, randomized trial that tested paracetam in people with acute ischemic stroke, hence the name PASS, paracetam in acute stroke. They enrolled over 900 patients and gave them either paracetam or placebo within 12 hours of stroke onset. The main goal here was to see how they were doing neurologically at 4 weeks and secondarily at 12 weeks with regards to overall function. Results indicated no major difference between groups overall. But when they looked back at the data after the study was completed, there seemed to be a possible benefit if paracetam was to be given earlier, within 7 hours rather than 12, especially for people with more severe strokes. However, this was in the context of a post hoc analysis, so looking back at the data rather than something that was discreetly tested. Outside of stroke, paracetam's effects on memory have been really hit or miss, surprisingly so given what you see online with regards to anecdotal reports and possible use recreationally. A meta-analysis of clinical trials in adults with memory issues found no clear benefit compared to placebo, which makes its role in memory enhancement honestly kind of shaky and rather unclear. The Cochrane Review on its use in stroke also found no strong evidence that it reduces death or disability, basically saying we need more robust longer duration studies. Interestingly, paracetam might have a specific utility in treating aphasia, a speech-language disorder that oftentimes follows stroke. Some studies, including data from the past trial, suggest it might actually help when paired with speech therapy, improving recovery in people with post-stroke aphasia. That said, it's a finding supported by limited evidence and not a generally accepted form of treatment for such. But the bottom line here is paracetam shows some promise in certain areas, but the evidence is mixed and inconsistent. According to the data, it's not a miracle worker for cognitive or neurological issues, and more solid clinical trials are needed to figure out where or if it really fits in. The most recently published systematic review in 2024 on the topic in particular on paracetam and memory, which looked at 199 articles and over 800 patients, Within this, the researchers adequately state, and I quote, Despite extensive research, our findings suggest that paracetam does not yield significant cognitive enhancements, end quote. And perhaps the results are tied to different populations of people and disease states tested, but for my sake at least, I cannot say that the research echoes a lot of the positive public sentiment with regards to memory and cognition. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit and get into phenylparacetam. And this is a good point really quickly to plug the channel. If you do like this evidence-based content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best way to help a small, predominantly peptide YouTuber out. If you're looking for additional ways to support the channel, the links to the Patreon and the 20-page BPC-157 educational guide will be in the description below as well. I appreciate you. So, phenylparacetam. As its name suggests, it's not too structurally dissimilar from puracetam. It's paracetam with a phenyl group. It's thought to be more potent and more stimulatory, and from a pharmacokinetic standpoint, they're pretty similar. They both have a half-life between approximately 3 to 5 hours. Phenylparacetam sits within that range. Paracetam is more notably at about 4.4 hours, so not too different. What makes phenylparacetam interesting, in my opinion at least, is it's formulated as a racemic mixture, which means it contains two enantiomers, or compounds that are essentially mirror images of one another. And because they're two different compounds, they technically have different pharmacokinetic and physiologic profiles. But together, we get what's known as phenylparacetam today. Now, in rodents, phenylparacetam has been shown to improve cognitive functions, physical condition, and reduce body weight gain without affecting locomotor activity, which essentially means it acts similar to a stimulant in the sense that it could be more inhibitory towards weight gain without the motor response, shakiness for instance, that's a familiar adverse effect to stimulant use. 
It's also been shown to demonstrate antidepressant and memory enhancing effects in these preclinical models. And as such, it's approved for use only in Russia and Eastern European countries. Its proposed mechanism of action is by acting as a selective dopamine transporter or DAT inhibitor, which would enhance dopaminergic transmission and modulate activity of dopamine. This could theoretically be responsible for cognitive, mood, and stimulatory properties, which it's reported by some to have. Additionally, the compound may influence glutamate receptors and calcium influx into neuronal cells, although these mechanisms, like with this main proposed mechanism of influencing primarily dopamine, aren't too well understood. That's why I highlighted the caveat in the beginning, in that although we have general ideas about these different compounds' mechanisms, we really don't know at the end of the day. The limitations of phenylparacetam include the need for more extensive clinical trials to confirm its efficacy and safety profile. The current evidence is promising but not definitive, and the thing is when we're testing use of these compounds in healthy people, it does raise ethical concern, although it's for the most part what my audience is here is interested in. I figured I'd share this with you too. This concern is multifaceted, and so we won't touch every single part of it, and it ties to a lot of the compounds we talk about as well. But some things to consider are side effect burden in people who find no needed benefit from the drug, and so publishing such results could lean people towards poorly compounded ingredients, and especially in the realm of cognitive enhancers and nootropics, one may worry that participants would almost be forced to feel a certain way, that their true cognitive potential wouldn't be reached if not for the drug in question, which in my opinion is an interesting dilemma. And I will add that with this compound, although popularly more potent and more palpable than pure acetam, comparatively, its clinical research is lacking. In contrast, from paracetam with phenylparacetam, studies conducted outside of Eastern Europe and reviews of such essentially are non-existent. Even published clinical reviews are quite sparse. But to summarize here, preclinical studies on phenylparacetam have shown promising results in terms of cognitive enhancement, weight management, and neuroprotective effects. However, these studies are limited by their focus on animal models, short-term outcome measurements, and the need for further research to confirm the mechanisms and long-term safety in humans. Right, at a very minimum, we need to learn long-term safety outcomes. But also of utmost importance in this case, the utility of phenylparacetam from a clinical standpoint is indeed complicated by its racemic mixture. The R enantiomer is thought to be more potent for cognitive enhancement and memory, while the S enantiomer has shown beneficial results for weight loss. This distinction is important for understanding the drug's effects and optimizing its use. So to cap things off, let's switch gears and talk about Nuapept, also known as Ambaracetam, which was discovered at the Russian Academy of Medical Sciences. Now something worth mentioning here is that Nuapept is not a racetam. Although it's often grouped with racetams due to its similar effects on cognitive function as well as the name, its chemical structure is distinct from that of traditional racetams like piracetam and phenol paracetam. Nuapept is actually a dipeptide analog of paracetam and works through multiple mechanisms which we'll get into here. It's considered a newer nootropic characterized by its high oral bioavailability for brain tissue. The mechanism of action of this compound is thought to be multifaceted, once again not fully confirmed, however involving modulation of various neurotransmitter systems, including cholinergic and glutamatergic pathways. And something worth noting is that when compounds influence these neurotransmitter pathways' intricate brain physiology, it is understandably very tough to adequately be able to decipher a mechanism of action. From a more discrete standpoint, that said, there's still a ways to go. It's been shown to increase the frequency of inhibitory postsynaptic currents in hippocampal neurons, suggesting an interaction with the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, acetylcholine is a key neurotransmitter involved in learning, memory, and attention. These alpha-7 receptors are likely specialized docking stations for acetylcholine, and they're found in high concentrations in brain areas critical for cognitive function, like the hippocampus. So when Nuopept interacts with these receptors, it's thought to 
really boost their activity. This, in turn, can theoretically enhance the release of acetylcholine and improve the signaling between neurons. So in essence, Nuopept might be fine-tuning the brain's acetylcholine system, making it work more efficiently for cognitive tasks. Additionally, in preclinical models, it's demonstrated neuroprotective effects and models of neurocognitive illness by reducing oxidative stress, apoptosis, and tau hyperphosphorylation, which are structural features of Alzheimer's disease, for instance. There was a single clinical trial published out of Russia in 2009 to look at the use of the compound in people with different forms of brain disease, predominantly vascular in nature or related to traumatic injury. And it was essentially a head-to-head -head between paracetam and nuopept. Results showed that nuopept was more effective and faster acting than paracetam in alleviating cognitive impairments, neurosis-like symptoms, things like irritability, emotional instability, fatigue, and other issues such as headaches. Patients treated with Nuopept experienced improved attention, memory, emotional stability, and sleep quality earlier in the treatment course, typically within the first few weeks. These effects were attributed by researchers to Nuopept's anxiolytic, psychostimulatory, and autonomic normalizing properties. In contrast, Parastam showed slower progress and was associated with a higher dropout rate due to side effects or lack of efficacy. However, despite these promising results, the study did have several limitations. The sample size was small, limiting ability to generalize results. The trial duration was only 56 days. And although that seems like a good amount of time, it really does leave long-term efficacy and safety unexplored. Additionally, the absence of a placebo group made it difficult to roll out placebo effects or natural recovery as contributors to observed improvements. And on top of that, patients with severe cognitive impairments or psychiatric comorbidities were excluded, restricting applicability to broader groups of people. Importantly, there is concern for bias as the study was conducted by the very researchers who founded the compound, the ones affiliated affiliated with the institute that did develop Nuopep. So of the three discussed, Piracetam does have the most research behind it. And when we do have a greater body of research, we see that what is found actually becomes much more controversial and debatable and unclear. And that's why having a good amount of data is important so we can really assess the compounds from every angle, from safety to maximize dosing, to effects, to pharmacokinetics. And even though these are used by tons and tons of people worldwide, from what I've read through, it's not the most convincing thing in the world, which Honestly, if you've seen my videos, you know probably wouldn't come as a surprise. But I do want to thank you for taking the time to watch this. This video in particular was requested by a few subscribers, and so I hope that this did, in a way, scratch the itch. Um, but thank you for your time. I hope you have a great day, and take care. I'll see ya. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.